Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox, and thanks for logging on. We're waking up with watches, and everything you see is for sale. Contact me, tmasso, at thewatchbox.com for pricing and details of any watch you see here, even if you just have extra questions. And if you're looking to trade or sell a watch, I am always looking to build inventory. We pay cash, we pay fast, I will buy one watch or an entire collection, no upper limit on value paid. If you wish to buy, trade, or sell, your online concierge email is tmasso at thewatchbox.com. Box.com. Let's jump straight in with the new face of Zenith. That is to say, this is your standard issue classical immortal watch from a company that has never strictly had one great Calatrava or Nautilus style design. The El Primero movement has been its standard, and of all the watches graced by the El Primero over the years, the 1969 A386 is probably the most iconic. So this is as close as you get to having a Zenith design that is as iconic as the movement itself. You're getting a lot here. This is the new Chronomaster Original. As you can see, it features a wonderful suede strap with a rubber underlay for absolute comfort on the wrist and a lovely vintage look. It does come with a full deployment clasp, so this is a vintage look, but a modern watch. As you can see, 38 millimeters in steel. This is not the extravagant tonneau case DeFi design, nor is it an open dial as we have the classic Zenith tritone overlapping registers. We also have a lovely, highly cambered sapphire. It is a sapphire designed to give you the look of a vintage plexiglass, lovely beveling on the squared off vintage style lugs with satination on the top, and then a sunburst on the dial. Outboard, we have something unusual, a 10 second foudroyant. This takes advantage of the one tenth of a second resolution of the El Primero. The resolution down to one tenth of a second is difficult to read on a sub register, so Zenith took 10 seconds and broke them up over 360 degrees of the dial to make it easier to read, for example, 3.5 tenths of a second. That's how that works. And of course, it is visually spectacular. It also gives you a 60 minute chronograph register. So will you lose the hour? I find this more agreeable as I prefer to see a 60 minute register rather than a 30 minute register on my chrono. Let's turn the lights off real quick. It is loomed, as you can see, quite well in fact. And when you flip it all over, we have the next generation Zenith El Primero Caliber 3600. Unofficially, this is the El Primero 2. We first saw it in 2019 on the 50th anniversary El Primeros, and you can see that it gives you a lot for your money. Automatic winding, 60 hour power reserve, 36,000 vibration per hour, 10 beat per second escapement, as every El Primero, save the Rolex versions, has been since 1969. Now you can see it is also a lovely column wheel lateral clutch chrono. Zenith choosing to preserve the lateral clutch, which is a more vintage system, but also a finer one. It's how more expensive Patek Philippe chronographs are still made. So retaining the lateral clutch along with the traditional column wheel adds to the beauty of the movement and a feature that was not previously available on standard El Primero watches, you have the hacking seconds. So that's a big upgrade here. It is an easy watch to wear. As you can see, 38 millimeters in steel, perfectly sized for today's tastes. And frankly, you could use this as a unisex option on most wrists. It wears nicely, it has presence, it doesn't need size to get the message across. Let's talk about a couple of other sports watches, starting with one that's in white metal but precious metal. This is one of my favorite watches. The Rolex Daytona in white gold, a lovely piece that has, well, loom we're going to enjoy right now. With radially arrayed Arabic numerals, this is the 116509, a lovely panda dial with touches of red, a high-grade set of applique numerals, giving the dial excellent depth, polished chapter rings for the sub-registers. You can see how it makes the most of its colors, and it has a wonderful sandpaper-like grané satination. This is one of the most distinctive of the six-digit Daytonas. So of all the Daytonas made from 2000 to the present in the six-digit reference era, this is one of the most memorable, and to my eye at least, one of the most aesthetically appealing. Throw it on the wrist, it's got a lot of presence. Again, like the El Primero you just saw, it's not a big watch at 40 millimeters. It is 100 meters water resistant, anti-magnetic shock resistant, three-day power reserve, vertical clutch, and a column wheel. But what makes this watch is the iconic look, the tri-register dial, the tachymeter, the screw downs. This is a Rolex Daytona, the ultimate motorsports chronograph, whether you're a driver or just a fan. This is one of my favorite watches on the show today. Now, let's say 
You're less about Daytona Speedway and maybe more about Miami Beach heading down to South Florida. You're going to want this. This, of course, is a GMT Master II in full yellow gold, black sapphires, paved diamond lugs, paved diamond crown guards. This is the 116758 SANR, a watch launched in 2007. It is a spectacular but still functional Rolex Aviators watch. You have the bi-directional bezel. You have the true dual time capability with the ability to set that local hand forward or backwards as you travel. Note the 24 hour hand does not budge. It's still 100 meters water resistant and like the Daytona, still shock resistant, water resistant and a chronometer certified Rolex timepiece that looks great on the wrist. It's got, well, it's got a rather loud appearance to it. This is for the confident man, I have to say. It's not a huge watch, though. You can see it's fairly thin and will fit underneath the cuff, and it's well done. I should mention that these Rolex watches with gem set lugs, dials, crown guard profiles and bezels. These are the last truly handmade Rolex watches. Everything else in their process has been automated except for gem settings. So if you want a handmade Rolex, this is the only way to do it in the modern era. A lot of work went into this watch. If it takes just a few hours to make a Rolex watch, you can multiply that by at least a dozen to build this one. We're going to stick with gold. Not quite as bold, a little bit more classical here. This is the much sought Vacheron Historique Chronograph 47101, made from the late 80s through the early 2000s. It's a 36.5 millimeter watch that draws its case lines and dial design from the vintage reference 4178. Now you can see there is a lot to love here. The dial is a silver, sort of opaline, frosted base, applique indices and numerals, lovely rolled, almost barrel shaped golden hand that have the sort of depth you expect on a really good modern independent brand watch. You can see that the lugs are soldered into place. This is old school case construction. Flip it all over and you can see this one features pre-1995, or I should say pre-second half 1995 hallmarks as we have the old Helvetic head rather than the dog in the diamond that came after mid-year 1995. As you can see, this is from the first half of this watch's production. We have an immaculately finished caliber 1140 manual wind, overcoil hairspring, 18,000 vibrations per hour, very traditional, based on the Le Mans 2310 that also did business in the Omega Speedmaster as the Caliber 321 and in the Patek Philippe 5070 as the CH2770. This is as good as it gets. You can see the steel components of the chronograph are finished as finely as the brass components of the bridges and plates. All screw heads are black polished with chamfered slots and circumference. It is a lateral clutch column wheel chrono and you can see the column wheel has been entirely black polished. Satination on top of the steel components for the chronograph and you can see both the bridges and the chronograph components have been mirror beveled. It is a very special watch with those signature Vacheron lugs. Vacheron doesn't have a design icon like the Nautilus or the Royal Oak or the Reverso. What Vacheron has is a long tradition of glorious watch lug designs, many of them with many different characters. And you can see this watch viable on a wrist as small as 13 centimeters in circumference is a great option for him or for her. And as a 1990s timepiece, it is now officially a vintage watch in its own right. Now we're gonna Hark back to 1955 and the 6087 chronograph. Very few of those made, not even 36 watches completed in total. So the watch that you see here is a modern stainless steel 38.5 millimeter Historique collection series piece uh, that came out in 2019, the steel version with the silver opaline dial, sunken registers with azurage concentric patterns. You can see white gold hands, indices, and Roman numerals. The corn de vache lugs that defined the reference 6087 of 1955, the horn of a cow, corn de vache. And as you can see, it is beautiful, simple, larger than the original, but just as compelling. Turn it over, and you can see this is caliber 1142. It's a somewhat updated version of the Le Mans caliber you saw in the 47101. And I should mention that not all 47 
1701s have display case backs, so this one is a little bit of a rare find in that regard. Here you can see the movement executed to a higher standard. This is very good, but they didn't technically seek the Poinçon de Genève, whereas on this watch with the 1142 caliber, they do. Is the finishing that different in substance? No, they're both very, very good. But going through the process is going to mean more to some people. And to that end, it's not just a Geneva Hallmark movement, but also case. As post-2012, this is now a full watch standard. You can see a few changes here as the balance is now free sprung for better precise setting as well as durability against shock and you can see that the column wheel has changed its center is no longer a polished screw but a little Maltese cross Vacheron Constantin logo and you can see the difference between the column wheel caps here and here so there are some new refinements here it's not just that they put a stamp on it throw it on the wrist it does have more presence uh, this is a watch that wears a little bit more modern it's still not huge it's nowhere near oversized I wouldn't even call it a full-sized watch but at 38.5 millimeters it is larger than the original 1955 6087 Jumping into the realm of discontinued watches and latter-day legends, we have here a watch that debuted in 2012. This is the white dial, Patek Philippe 5711. This is the 011. So it's probably the most legible 5711 with black and white gold hands and indices on a silver white dial base. Now, it's also extremely well-loomed for a watch that's as thin as this is, only 8.6 millimeters thick. It is shockingly well-loomed, durable, and water-resistant at 120 meters. This is a watch that really can do it all. You can see just how thin it is, and it takes upwards of 30 hours to hand finish all parts of the case and bracelet. So you can see one of the reasons the Nautilus costs more at retail far more than an Aquanaut. The case is just more complex, more parts, more individual facets to finish differently, and more intricate finishing patterns. The difference is substantial. Turn it all over, we have a caliber 324, anti-magnetic adjusted in six positions, and with the Patek Philippe seal and the silicon hairspring, the Gyromax style free sprung balance, and that again, six position adjustment, this watch is guaranteed from Patek to run no worse than minus three plus two seconds per day. Already discontinued, we're now in the final year of all 57 11's period. So this watch is going to become a little bit more interesting to collectors as we move down the line and farther and farther from the production lifetime of the 5711. That said, if you're not after one of what is admittedly the most hyped watches on the market, I've got some great alternatives we're going to talk about in a moment. But first, let's talk about a watch that gives you steel, albeit in a larger magnitude here. This is the 5035-10, a 2018 44.2 millimeter stainless steel 150 piece limited edition Portuguese annual calendar developed for the Middle Eastern markets. And you can see it uses the green dial that is characteristic of Middle East editions. Again, local custom, green being the color of paradise. You can see it also has a number of handsome red gold garnishings to contrast. And then a nicely balanced dial with your month, your date, and your day up at 12 o'clock. It is an annual calendar. You adjust it once annually during the jump from February to March. Now, I'll just roll away to make sure we're not in the day change danger zone. You can see how we do have hacking seconds, one of many refinements this watch boasts. And then we also have a quick set system, so you can rapidly set the calendar by rolling the crown in different directions. And you can set both the month, date, and the day in quick set fashion. Turn it all over, automatic winding, seven day power reserve. This is the latest version of the 52,000 series of movements. And you can see that upgrades for the 52,000 series include a full ceramic Peloton winding system. You can see it features both ceramic poles and wheels, which precludes the need for any kind of lubrication, but also prevents the dirt on the movement problem that plagued earlier versions of this caliber. The movement is huge, one of the largest automatic calibers in the world. It's over 37 millimeters in diameter. And you can see another change for the 52,000 series, two barrels. So you still have the same power reserve, but with two barrels, you no longer have the phenomenon of a watch that runs very fast when fully wound and very slow when largely discharged. This caliber, 52,850 is a very efficient, regular, superb timekeeper, free sprung with an overcoil hairspring made by hand and five position adjustment. It is not just long legged and technically proficient, it is a very accurate watch. This was not always true with the previous 5,000 and 50,000 series movements. So this is the best version. Let's say you wanna go big, but you don't want something from a major brand. You wanna 
patronize an independent or at least get on board with an independent product. This is the Louis Monet Tempograph Chrome, a model launched in 2018, 44 millimeters in red gold, Louis Monet creating a movement that gives you a 20 second retrograde, a lovely black lacquer dial with a little bit of loom. You can see that there is a 360 degree seconds indicator that actually moves relative to an index and then you have your three sweeps of 120 degrees. You've got that constant retrograde, which animates the dial. Lovely guilloche work that garnishes and surrounds the center dial. You can see a lot of the movement execution, the beveling, as well as the satination and the black polishing of the screws. It's on the dial side. It is an automatic winder with a 48-hour power reserve. You can see the movement finish is high horology. It's a 60-piece limited edition. As you can see, there is a lot going on with this case. Satin finish, high polish. You can see that the pivots for the spring bars they're actually a little chaton, like you would find in a vintage movement, fixed in place by screws, so it's a very secure system. Strictly speaking, you could see that this is one of the most elaborate and intricate case and dial designs you will ever encounter. So while the brand Louis Monet might not be universally known, it's a bit of a connoisseur's brand. For those who want something spectacular, that is spectacular for what it is rather than the name on the dial. This is a watch that speaks for itself, but bring a big wrist. Your wrist is going to have to be as large as mine or larger, 16 centimeters circumference or up to wear this Tempograph Chrome. Back to the world of Vacheron and the Middle East, and we've got two special watches in succession, starting with a model that came out late 2017. This is the Historique Triple Calendar with Corn de Vache lugs. This is based on the historic 1942 reference 4240 Triple Calendar. The original would have featured a Lecoultre movement. This one features a Geneva Hallmark 65-hour power reserve Vacheron 4401. So you can see Geneva Hallmark on case as well as movement beautifully finished. And as you can see, it is everything you would expect of Geneva Hallmark movement. The best thing here is that it is a very traditional layout with a center wheel architecture, no automatic winding, so you can see the whole movement unobscured by a winding bridge or rotor. It is very well done. My favorite details being the little intricate interior angles adjacent to the escape wheel. So this is a very nicely finished movement. Turning it all over, you can see a champagne sunburst dial with a lovely 1940 style font. I particularly enjoy that open nine. There's a radial indication for the date, which is blue on silver. And then we have a number of colors here. We have white, we have black, we have blue, we have red, and champagne. And we have hands that are narrow and fire blued to recreate the look of the early 1940s. Note the case, 40 millimeters in stainless steel, features these little gadroons in its flank, so it has a lovely set of strakes, and then of course those cow horn lugs. The watch wears beautifully on a wrist as small as 13 and a half centimeters circumference, so again, a great option if you want something discreet. It is low enough to fit underneath the cuff. You can see it has that dramatically domed sapphire to look like a vintage plexiglass, and if you look carefully, you can see that the calendars, the day and the month, are blue printing on silver, which I adore. So this is a very special watch, and one of Vacheron's best in the modern era. In fact, if you wanted to own a two-watch steel Vacheron collection, we're talking greatest hits right here. I mean, it really doesn't get a whole lot better. Buy them both, and again, you're going to get into these watches for less than the cost of that Nautilus you just saw. You're going to get into both of these watches for less than the cost of that Nautilus. That's why I always tell people, chase value, not hype. Now, if the Nautilus is what you want, nothing else will suffice, but let's say you want a little bit more rarity and panache to your Middle Eastern edition watch while I bring you the F.P. Journ Chronomet Middle East. This is based on the Chronomet Souverain slash Chronomet Bleu, and you can see that it is a very special watch with a lustrous green lacquer dial and lovely satinated white gold applique numerals. Very different from the Chronomet Bleu in that this watch has more height to its dial. The Bleu has a pretty much flat featureless dial that's been printed. And while that's warm and attractive, this, along with the media blasted hands at center, absolutely peerless. This is a very special watch. Platinum case, rose gold movement, very limited edition with only 99 made. And as you can see, it is a gorgeous thing on both sides. Twin mainspring barrels, this is caliber 1304. So the twin barrels, and then you have a hidden drive train with the train actually under the dial. So you can see the barrels and you can see the escapement, but you can't actually see the movement of the energy through a going train. There's nothing but a big open gulf between these structures that opens up the movement for several different finishes. As we have Cote de Genève linear across the bridges, mirrored on glage, and this gets better and 
and better from F.P. Jorn every single year. You can see that on the edge of every bridge. We can also see that there's a sort of soleil sunburst pattern radiating out from underneath the mainspring barrels. And then underneath the balance, you can see there are actually two different sizes of perlage. There's one on the bridge that caps the anchor, and that's a large perlage. And then there's a smaller perlage underneath the balance proper, all with black polished screws. These movements have 56-hour manual wind power reserves. And as you can see, free sprung with six position adjustment. That's why this is called chronomet. It's a 40 millimeter as compared to the 39 of the chronomet bleu. So it's about the size of a chronomet souverain, uh, but it is more like the bleu in terms of architecture because it does not have a power reserve on the dial. A wonderful, suede, slightly glossy calfskin strap. It has a wonderful feel to it. It feels almost like a synthetic. It has a rubbery quality to it. It is very, very special and very, very handsome. This is one of the best watches F.P. Jorn has ever launched. From an aesthetic standpoint, I would put it in my personal top five. But let's say you want a more traditional F.P. Jorn watch, you're not into white metals, and you want the full-fat Chronomet Souverain with the power reserve indicator. Well, I have that right here. This is the Chronomet Souverain, 40 millimeters. It's only 8.7 millimeters thick, so it's, it's nice and flat on the wrist. It's broad, it's handsome, it's silver of dial, rose gold of case and of movement. Throw it on the wrist, and you can see that it has the same stance as the Middle East. It's just a watch that has a very different look with the contrast between the silver and the red being rather severe and hard one by design with more classical blued hands and then a pyramid pattern at the center of the dial. Once again, we have the exact same movement, technically identical. You can see the finish is also identical. So this is just a matter of taste, which one you prefer. And of course, there's also the rarity that comes with the Middle East edition. That would be my favorite of the two. Given a choice between these two, you know I'm a sucker for green. I gotta go with this guy. That said, some will prefer the classical Chronomet Souverain, including our own Josh Thanos, who would basically get all in on this watch if he had the money tomorrow. And then, of course, there's this right here, which for me is just a little bit more lustrous and special with the luminous hands and the luminous applique above the dial. It, it does something for me that very few Jorns do. You know I'm not a Jorn fan in general. I'm more of a fan of Debetun. And this is a great way to get into the brand because a lot of folks tell me the DB28 is too big, it's too extravagant with the open dials, they don't like the floating lugs, it's just a bit too avant-garde. They want something that's discreet, handsome, classical, that's wearable on a smaller wrist, and at 40 millimeters, this Debatoon DB25 power reserve is all of those things. Now, this is a model launched in 2007 and now discontinued. You can't get the automatic 40 anymore. I should mention that Debatoon makes its own dials, cases, and movements, so you're getting a lot of value when you buy this watch. It's not like some companies, such as Chapek, which are very open about buying all their own parts, or Laurent Ferrier, which finishes its parts in-house. This is all in-house. Now, the dial features a guilloche in a sort of rayon pattern. You can see it radiates out from the center. This is done with a rose engine, and Debetune has its own rose lathes in-house. The hands are fired blue titanium using a process that Debetune has patented. And then you can see the rest of the dial is a silver opaline or light satin with blue printing for nice colorful contrast. There is a power reserve indicator. You can see it up at 12 o'clock. The watch is automatic winding, so you don't need to wind it manually, but you can see it's fun to see the animated features of a watch. And the power reserve will transition from red to white as you wind Wind it. Conventional crown, not a bullhead winder like the DB28s, and conventional lugs, not floating lugs as you'll find on the DB28s. Now, the movement is a version of Debatoon's DB2024 automatic. There's a lot to love. Six-day power reserve, twin self-adjusting mainspring barrels, an enormous blue titanium rotor with a platinum mass outboard and a patented shock protection system at the center so that the lever arms and the mechanical advantage of the rotor can be huge, but there's also a brace for the bearing at the center. That's what this little set of cantilevers with jewels, that's what that's for. That's a shock protection system. There's also one, two, three shock protection springs for the balance staff. That allows the watch to better deal with shock, yes, for sake of durability, but also to rapidly recenter the balance staff to resume accurate timekeeping. So this is really here for chronometry, not just durability. Now, the balance, you can see, is a yoke. It's not a wheel, it's a yoke, crucified form with a titanium center and then the masses out at the edge in bulb form are made of platinum so it has very little reaction to hot or cold doesn't expand or contract will not change the timing of the watch and the platinum puts all of the mass to the degree possible out at the edge of the balance wheel now you can also see the hairspring is two pieces shaped by hand and clamped together giving you the 
concentric breathing of an overcoil in any position with respect to gravity, but without the thickness or shock susceptibility of an overcoil. Now on the wrist, you can see, this is a beautifully sized watch. These are extremely rare. Only a few dozen of these were made, as you see, per year. De Batoon never made more than about 425, 430 watches in a year during its peak of production from about 2011 to 2014. And today, the company's making about 150 watches a year. They've made fewer than 3,000 since their inception in 2002. So you get real rarity as well as engineering and craft value with a De Batoon watch. Now, if you want to see something spectacular, and here it comes... We're gonna stick with the Debatoon for a moment and a watch they launched back in 2019. Now what you see right here is a little bit of black badger luminant material. So the camera's having some trouble picking this up because it's not focusing, but it's actually a quite well-loomed watch in the conventional sense. That said, once you activate the LED lights on the Debatoon DB28GS Grand Bleu, you don't need luminant material. Running off the mainspring barrel, you can see it uses a minute repeater style governor to slow down the release of power and it backlights its unidirectional rotating dive style bezel. This is a dive style watch, 105 meters water resistant, rotating bezel, one of the few center second applications you will ever see on a DB28. There's a little power reserve adjacent to the dial that tracks the five days of power reserve. You can actually see the power reserve mechanism through the case back. It's only 13 millimeters thick, so it's smaller than you think, and it features this micro light engraving on both the case and the dial. This is done using a lathe, but De Betun didn't feel that conventional guilloche would be appropriate for a watch this progressive in design. This is very forward-looking, technologically advanced, and it wears its tech on your sleeve, so to speak. So they went with this micro light engraving, and then you can see they black polished the edges of the barrel bridge as well as the support system for the hands that center and then you can see that the entire balance bridge has been black polished and the bridges have all been mirror unglage beveled on their edges so while the watch looks very futuristic one might say the finish is of old school design so it is very traditional all of it lavished manually and again you have all of this with the triple shock protection the proprietary balance wheel the hairspring and that minute repeater governor which you could see better underneath my finger it slows down the discharge of energy from the mainspring barrel so that the watch will run it will light itself for about 30 seconds when fully wound now here in this 43 millimeter watch Truth be told, it's 43.5. It's between 43 and 44, so it's a little bit different uh, than it's listed. It says 44. It's more like a 43.5. Uh, if you measure from the bezel, it's 44. If you measure the case, it's 43. But thanks to the floating lugs, it will conform to your wrist, and I'll show you how that works. The DB28 debuted back in 2010, and in 2011, its first full year on the market, it won the GPHG Aguido, the overall prize at the Oscars of watchmaking. This is the DB28 substantially evolved for a sporting application, all in titanium with the floating lugs. It fits even a small wrist like mine and you can see it seems natural the further away you get from the camera the better it looks proportionally this is a very special watch and probably the most distinctive unique and desirable sports watch available on the market today we're sticking with our independence and an independent that i feel is underrated there was a lot of talk about laurent ferrier between the brand's founding in 2008 and 2013 when it launched the last of its modern galley series to receive widespread acclaim. Now, later on would come the Galais Square, the Montre Echo, the Bridge One, the Origine, and not all of these watches received the same level of acclaim that we saw in the first years with the Double Spiral Tourbillon and the Galais Micro Rotor. What we have here is that original 2010 GPHG Men's Watch Prize winner. As you can see, a 40.5, it's, it's a 41, but it's more like a 40.5 in white gold. This is the Double Spiral Tourbillon. It has an enamel dial, an extraordinary vitreous baked enamel dial, glass paint, solid gold dial base, and you can see there's a second disc of enamel with red calibrations for the sub-second. You can see there's also a polished chapter ring that rings that, and an assegai or spear-shaped set of white gold hands. Galet. This is the galet tourbillon double spiral, referring to a pebble, in this case a pebble that's been smoothed in a stream over eons. Now the movement is the 
L96001, and there is a lot to love. If you check out the bridge architecture and the tourbillon cage architecture, you can see Laurent Ferrier paying tribute to his former employer, Patek Philippe. This is the look of Patek chronometry trial tourbillon watches from the mid-20th century. So we have this extravagant bridge structure, an enormous single barrel giving you 80 hours of manual wind power reserve. It beats away at 21.6. It has one, two hair springs that are horizontally opposed 180 degrees out of phase. So when due to gravity, one is slowing down, the other, by an equal and opposite magnitude, will speed up. Thus, no matter the position of the watch or the angle of the watch on your dresser or wrist, this is a tourbillon that really does act in a chronometric function. As Abraham Louis Breguet anticipated, this is a tourbillon that will improve the regularity of your watch, not because of the tourbillon, but because of the opposed hair springs. And you can see they're both free sprung. In this case, adjusted to all positions means six, one more than a standard chronometer. And here you could see one of my favorite features of Laurent Ferrier watches, the beveling on the bridges, a mile wide, so bright and luminous, you don't even need a loop to appreciate it. You can also see we have one, two, three, four, five, six sharp interior angles where bevels meet, and that's just on the tourbillon bridge itself. The entire tourbillon cage has been black polished. You can see the carriage is all of black polish. Every screw head has been black polished. The Cote de Genève are broader and more luminous than you'll find on even Geneva Hallmark watches. And you can see the click spring for the barrel has been entirely black polished and rounded with specular finish all the way around. It truly is above and beyond even the best that Patek Philippe and Vacheron offer on their standard watches. If you want this level of finish on a Patek, you're going to have to buy something like a 5316 and step up into the high six-figure, low seven-figure range. This is what you're going to see on Grubel 4 c It's what you're going to see on a Kerry Voudelainen watch. It's that good. It's as good as Fernand Bertou. And you can get it on a watch that, frankly, no one is talking about right now from an independent that, if anything, has become underrated. They're only making 170 watches a year at Laurent Ferrier, and while they do work with suppliers for their cases, their dials, and their movement parts, all of the finishing of the parts and the adjustment of the mechanism is done in-house at Laurent Ferrier, and the pieces are extraordinary. They even bevel the interior of their wheels and chamfer the spokes, so they create sharp interior angles and bevels inside the wheels of the train. Once more, an easy watch to wear, 41 millimeters, a good all-around size, not too big, not too small, with a lot of presence, but not obnoxious. One of the few tourbillon watches I would wear because I only wear case-back tourbillon timepieces, and I've only bought case-back tourbillon timepieces, and this is right up my alley. All right, what could possibly top that? A watch that is beyond compare. This, launched in 2016, is the Alango Unzona Datagraph Perpetual Calendar Tourbillon. 41 millimeters, this watch in platinum, weighs a ton, and it is a ton of fine finish, engineering, exclusivity, and imagination. A 100-piece limited edition with black-on-black -black dial. The dial made of sterling silver galvanized black and black individual discs for the double-digit date. White gold hands, indices, and date frame. One of the coolest features of this watch, if you should for example, let it fall behind a few days because it sits on your dresser or it sits in your watch box or safe. You pull the crown out and then you start making adjustments. Note that both the date and the day are adjusting here. And after a sufficient number of adjustments, you will see the month adjusts too. You pull the crown out and you start indexing the date and everything, including the moon phase, adjusts in sync. If you fall behind six days, pull out the crown, tap it six times, and you're right back up to speed. This watch has it all. It's loomed. It's got not just, not just a chronograph, not just a flyback chronograph, not just a perpetual calendar, but a tourbillon. And on the reverse side, what a tourbillon. You could see that the entire bridge, as well as the entire filigree or wire-style tourbillon carriage, has been black polished. Interior angles, many. And a rarity on tourbillon watches, a hacking seconds tourbillon. Take note, the capstone to the tourbillon is a real cut brilliant cut diamond. We have freehand engraving. We have fired blue screws, but also note on the chronograph mechanism for adjustment, we have polished screws. So both black polished 
and fired blue screws. We have jewels set in golden chiton, and of course that is a nod to the pocket watch era of longa watchmaking in the 19th and early 20th century. A lot of heritage nods here, including the shape of the tourbillon carriage. It is a free sprung balance with an overcoil hairspring, more refinements. We may as well wind this one up. And it actually has more power reserve than your standard datagraph from the time. This is a 50 hour power reserve. We'll fire it up. You can see it is a flyback chrono. You can reset and restart with one push of the trigger. And again, the dial is made of sterling silver. The hands and indices are made of white gold. And then so is the moon phase. And the moon phase has an adjustment interval of 122 years. This is caliber L9522, exclusive to this watch. A very special piece that has not just beauty, but also great depth. As viewed from any angle, it's an absolute standout and a showstopper. This is one of the most memorable watches I've ever encountered, and I've encountered them all. It includes a rare feature for a longer watch, a full deployant clasp, as even the standard a datagraph perpetual often ships with just a pin buckle. This is not a datagraph perpetual, it is the datagraph perpetual tourbillon, and it is a 100 piece limited edition. You get everything in this watch, including a power reserve indicator hiding at the corner of the dial. So it is a perpetual calendar, a flyback chronograph, a tourbillon with hacking seconds, a moon phase, and a power reserve. All of that in a watch at 41 millimeters that I can definitely wear on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist. It's not huge. And consider what you'd pay for a reshored meal. Consider what you'd pay for a Patek Grand complication. Consider what you'd pay for a watch like this from Grubel Forsey. Now realize what a bargain this watch has used. A watch that cost $350,000 when it was new back in 2016. As I mentioned, it is beyond compare. Reach out to me. T. Masso at thewatchbox.com with your purchase and pricing questions.